Hey, my name is Dennis Gregg, and I want to welcome everybody here tonight. Um, we have a slideshow that we've used various parts of in different presentations. Uh, tonight is a little shorter on Quaker history uh, because we were expecting that a lot of people who are on the uh, Zoom uh, would be Quakers and know some of this history. Uh, in any case, we're going to go fairly quickly. And if you have questions, uh, clarification, things that you want to know more detail about, uh, ask at the end. And um, we do have lots of resources we can point you towards uh, along the way. So tonight, uh, our Avis, Wanda McClinton, and uh, Kitty Mizuno, and Judith Bynes, and I will be the presenters, and we will each talk about different things. So as I say, we'll be moving fairly quickly, not so that you can't get anything out of the slides, but uh, but really we want to have time for people to talk about the impact. So what we're going to be really talking about is the goals of the project and why the project is important. Uh, we don't have anything to report yet. The research is just beginning, um, but we want people to understand what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. So Avis is going to, who began the project, is going to be next. There you go. Okay, Avis, floor is yours. Hi, um, my name is Avis Wanda McClinton, and I'm going to talk about um, the 339 Manumission and Beyond Project. I want to tell you first how it began. Um, it was a leading from God for me to find out what happened to the enslaved people that were held in bondage by people that were Quakers. A lot of people didn't know um, Quakers were enslavers. Um, I didn't know when I became a Quaker, but um, now that I know, I want to try to find out what what became of them. Just like I can sit on a meeting bench with a descendant of a Quaker slaver, enslaver, the enslaved people that were held in bondage, they here somewhere. They didn't disappear. So, hi, I'm here in Beautiful Pennsylvania in my backyard, showing off my beautiful garden. And there go me. The first slide, the second slide is me and um in Pennsylvania in a segregated class, and that's my kindergarten. And if you're looking for me, I'm on the left hand side right there. That's me. The little guy down under me that got a little crossed out. And I guess he made me mad and I crossed him out. But uh, I paid for it dearly when my mother saw it. So <laughs> I remember that day. Mm -hmm. well, what I wanted to tell you that um, people forget that slavery and Jim Crow and segregation was a diving well in, in, in the North and Northern slavery and northern um, discrimination against black people don't be talked about. Um, what I can say about that picture, for me personally, um, I we, that's my class, integrated with white children in the third grade. And it was a traumatic experience for me and the rest of them because the teachers and the janitors and the administration, they were very resentful of us coming and having to sit with the white kids in their class. So um, it was just not good, not a good time in the, in the 50s. I'll go to the next slide. I'll read the land acknowledgement. To first honor our Native American brothers and sisters, we acknowledge the Lenai Lenape as the original people of this land. 
and honor their continuing relationship with this territory. We acknowledge the continued presence of Lenape people in their homeland, and we affirm the aspiration of the great Lenape chief, Tamanend, that there be harmony between the indigenous people of this land and the descendants of the immigrants to this land, as long as the rivers and the creeks flow and the sun, moon, and stars shine. A religious society of friends, yes, Quakers, enslaved Africans. When I started this project a long time ago now, I put these two pictures up on my bulletin board to remind me what my ancestors endured and to say that I'm gonna do this in the most loving way that I can. Um, Black history has like never been talked about it didn't been a race because it wasn't here in the beginning. We we the only only race that people think that we're supposed to forget that would happen to us for all the many centuries. But um, with this this charge by God, I'm gonna do my very best to try to get some dignity. What is justice for these people? Oh. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna, I'm just going to do a, a real quick rundown on, on historical context and timeline. Uh, the PowerPoint uh, slide for doing this has a limit, so there's only uh, six uh, units on here, but I just want to put things in perspective um, for the time period that, that we're investigating um, uh, and why maybe it gives you a sense of what's happening. So 1619, the first Africans... Uh, that had been captured and were enslaved or brought to Virginia. Uh, it was around 1680, uh, and I'm not trying to, I, I, I'm not being absolutely precise because it's not really important to get the exact date, but around 1680 is when William Penn came to Pennsylvania uh, and Quakers began coming with him and, and uh, enslaved people uh, also came uh, very shortly afterwards, and William Penn, among many, many Quakers, uh, purchased folks and, and kept them enslaved and used their labor. Uh, but by the end of uh, 1680, 1688 was the first time that uh, some Quakers raised um, up the issue and said, this is wrong. Um, but it took 70 years uh, before they could get everyone to agree uh, in 1758 that it really was wrong. Um, and um, But you'll notice it was limited to saying uh, trading was wrong. And it took another uh, 16 years before they said you cannot be a Quaker anymore uh, if you're going to be an enslaver. But there were Quakers, because the discussion began in 1688, there were people who got to it sooner, and there were people who manumitted enslaved people earlier. But the major uh, uh, group of people who were manumitted, which and we'll talk about what that means exactly, happened, and the group that we're looking at were manumitted between 1765 and 1790, that is, that's when the documents were registered. And you'll also learn later that just because you got a document on a certain day doesn't mean you were freed on that day. And this is just to let you see, this is that time period we're talking about. Okay, next slide. So this uh, may look like a list of names, but, uh, and we don't often think about the historical folks in our families, you know, from the 1700s, but this group of individuals were the enslaved people of the 413 of the 339 manumissions that um, Avis and team will be uh, reviewing. And the most interesting piece is when you can make a connection and toward the bottom, Caesar and Celia are actually two mm -hmm. individuals that were manumitted that Kitty will speak about next. This is the manumission document for Caesar. 
who um, was enslaved by Jonathan Evans, who is my great, 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 great grandfather on my mother's side, a Quaker. And um, he lived uh, in Philadelphia on Second Street down near Dock Street. He, um, I think Arch Street meeting didn't exist in those days yet. He was a member of, um, he's listed on the list of uh, manumission documents as belonging to Southern Meeting in Philadelphia, the Southern District. And um, this is the document for Caesar. <clears throat> I uh, I um, didn't know until Haverford College made public these uh, manumission documents that they have in their Quaker collection. I had no idea that I had an ancestor who enslaved people. I may have more, but I'm aware of, of this one. And also this one, this is uh, Celia. And I'll just read what it says. I, Jonathan Evans of the city of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, do hereby set free from bondage my Negro woman, Celia, aged about 36 years, and do for myself, my executors and administrators release unto the said Celia all my right, all my claim whatsoever as to her person as or to any estate she may acquire, hereby declaring the said Celia absolutely free without any interruption from me or any person claiming under me. In witness whereof I have hereunto set my hand and seal this 27th day of the first month in the year of our Lord, 1779, sealed and delivered in the presence of Sean Piles and Benjamin Evans, and signed by Jonathan Evans. So um, it was a big shock to me to learn that that um, Celia and Caesar were enslaved by my ancestor. And um, I started to look up some things about them, and I learned that <clears throat> um, my that Jonathan, I'm just going to read a little bit from a book that I found about his son, Jonathan, who was a member of our street meeting. Um, but, but in the beginning of this book about his son, Jonathan Evans, the father, Jonathan Evans, who was the enslaver, uh, it describes something about him. It says he, he was engaged in importing West India produce, sugar, molasses, rum, and other products. And um, it goes on to say, in the opinion of the author of this book, whose name is William Bacon Evans, whom I remember as a child, he's a, a, a Quaker, uh, an Orthodox Quaker leader. Um, he writes, it, it would seem that Jonathan Evans took his Quakerism rather lightly. Ministers' sons do not always follow strictly in the footsteps of their fathers. It is not known whether he attended meetings regularly or not. Certain it is that his meeting dealt with for keeping slaves. And I think uh, pressure from his meeting was the reason why he created these two uh, manumission documents so that he could remain a member in good standing of his meeting. Really? Yes. Okay. Would you go back to the timeline? I want to Go back to the timeline of audience. You see in the red, the first date, June 19th, and the last date, November 3rd. Can you imagine what that, what that represented, that the violence of what Kitty just said, that her ancestor that's a historical document. He promised to release them to people. But a manumission is just that, a promise. We don't have any idea if they got their freedom. I'm a, I am a descendant of enslaved people. 
and the religion that are converted to is a religion that is built on slavery. All that time, all the many years that the early Quakers had enslaved people. And we just found that Haverford, 339 innocent people's manumissions. We profess to be pacifist, but everything we talking about is so violent. Um, I just go to the next uh, thing. I just got emotional right there, and I just wanted to say thank you. These were real people. This this is how Haverford when they they did digitalized their um, the records of these innocent people. And you go to the left and it say 1776. Um, this, this is, you, if nobody don't know how to read it, it's 17, uh, that's the year, the month, and the day. And the same person was Jack. And at that time, when he wrote this, or there was a man, Jack was 11 years old, and he is promised at 21, that's what that age is, that he might be free. Then he a male, and where his meeting was Abington, and that's, in, that's the meeting I attend, and Benjamin Lay, and Sheltonham, PA, and the slaver is Benjamin Matter right there, um, and he was a male, and these were the Next ones were the witnesses, and the last one, person Holloway Jr. William, that was the clerk at that time of Abington meeting. All this information is 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 vital to find out if and what happened to Jack. Here we put two manumissions. The next one, we go into the left again. And 1778, fourth month, 11 day. And this is Phoebe and the male child and the female child. They didn't give no names, no ages. But we know this one paper was for three people, a mommy and her two children and Northern District in Philadelphia. And this enslaver or slaveholder was a woman, Rebecca Steele. People forget that women inherit. They, 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 they were enslavers too, female. And the witnesses and the clerk of the meeting at that time. Everyone on the, this document um, are in, important because they have something to do with Phoebe and her children. So this is how um, Haverford uh, Archivist has got it laid out like this. So you can look at all 339, if you pull it up on your, um, on your computer, they digitalize it. Next slide, please. So what, what are we doing? The goals of the 339 project are really to acknowledge and recognize the forgotten 413 lives of these manumitted individuals. So as Kitty mentioned, how we get from the 339 to the 413 would be an example of what she had on the prior page where you have one family that may be on one manumission document. Second goal is to try to trace to the present, the families of these particular enslaved people, and then potentially provide the descendants of these enslaved people with an understanding of a small part of their ancestral history. Next slide. So I'm gonna to try to really briefly again, um, talk about how Quakers 
got to the understanding as a group. And as I said earlier, there were individuals who got to it way, way before the group as a whole got to the idea that uh, enslaving people was against their religion. You would think that would be obvious. Looking back, it seems obvious, but at the time, um, the idea of having uh, uh, people who worked for you either for no pay or for, in the case of slavery, uh, where you had complete control was widespread. So it, apparently it did not, uh, they were not separate enough from the rest of society for them to recognize that. And so how we ended up uh, as Quakers uh, in the 1750s, uh, uh, 58 and 60 and, and into 74 was uh, that there were two different things going on. Uh, abolitionism, if you will, began to rise up with various people advocating within the Society of Friends, Benjamin Lay is one person who's well known that that uh, was from Abington meeting uh, and uh, Avis mentioned him. He was eventually kicked out of Abington meeting because he wouldn't shut up about it. Um, but there were other people who followed in his foot uh, in his footsteps. There were other individuals who uh, agreed with him and were arguing that this was the right thing to do. But it wasn't enough to convince everybody else until um, there became a second. Uh, reason for Quakers to begin to rise up. And that was that uh, they had structured their society uh, based around trying to follow what God wanted. And they had said, we're going to dress simply. And, and there was a whole thing about Quaker dress. And so in that photograph there on the right, that was sort of typical uh, Quaker dress. It was either dark gray or uh, black. And they didn't put wear uh, special fancy clothes. And the idea was you got to live a special life. Well, unfortunately, when people got to the uh, Philadelphia area and uh, some of the early ones in particular who brought money with them were able to purchase people and purchase land and actually became quite wealthy. And they ended up becoming politically uh, influential. And so the Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Assembly was controlled by Quakers. The Philadelphia city uh, and county governments were controlled by Quakers. And uh, the same people who got wealthy and powerful also were in positions of responsibility and power within the Quaker world, including they controlled what was called the, the Quaker press. So you couldn't print something and send it out to Quakers unless this group approved it. And they prevented people from uh, approving uh, arguments against slavery. And so people who were in the Society of Friends who wanted to do it had to go outside of the Society of Friends to get their arguments printed. Uh, but this other group really said, we have to stop. We're, we're becoming immoral. We're becoming the people that we said we weren't going to be. And so there's overlap between the, the group, but there were really two different groups that came together. One saying, we've lost our way as a you know, in general, and the other one saying specifically, we've lost our way in terms of slavery. And so eventually they said, yes, this is wrong. And and they gave people a choice. And they said, you're either going to get rid of your slaves or you're going to leave uh, the, being a Quaker. And lots of people did leave. Um, but that gets to the second part, because one of the things that did not happen, uh, and there's a lot of reasons to think about it, but many of them are cultural, uh, is that even though Quakers eventually said, you can't be a Quaker if you're an enslaver, that didn't mean that they said these Africans and African Americans, the ones who were born here, were actually our equals. Um, and and so it's one thing to say this, this is a human being, and this human being needs to be treated uh, not like a piece of chattel or, a, or an animal or, or, a, or a possession. But it's not the same thing as saying this person is entirely equal and equivalent to me. And anything that is desirable for me would be desirable for them to see that true equality. 
and Quakers fell down on that issue. Uh, again, there were individual Quakers who were able to see the other, but as a society, we did not. Um, and so uh, when Quakers tried to join meeting or came to meeting, they were asked to sit in separate sections where they would not be directly in contact with the European Americans. And that idea of inequality and inferiority continues to filter down today. And it's part of what in modern uh, times in the last 15, 20 years, as people have begun talking about institutional racism, these kinds of terms, this is that thing that, that came down. There was a moment there in history where Quakers could have said, not only should these people be free, but they should have, they are exactly the same as us. And there's nothing that should hold them back. But we didn't say that. Um, I would like to jump in here a little bit. With the committee that God blessed me with to do this work, um, it's all of us as enslavers family, like Kitty and Wood is enslavers family, and me and and like Judith and the Senate of Enslavers. And everything we do, we we work together on. Now we had to we had to we had little arguments when we're talking about this stuff right here. For me, um, the early Quakers, they were despised people over there in England. Then they come over here and enslave my people and become wealthy, 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 and powerful. And then they could not see the God and the people, and that was what they professed to be. And the inferior, that's what I pushed to put that word up there, because in the meetings in 2024, that's all I feel. I feel as if I'm walking around in them times. Y'all, if you don't know, my history is getting kicked out of Upper Dublin monthly meeting and being told to go sit in the back. Well, with my goal here now today with this project, and I'm glad y'all came on board to hear it, is to use our love, our love now, to fix some of this wrong. How dare you early Quakers destroy families for profit and that's what we're going to talk about today you could have paid them people i worked on a project that uncovered this lost history of quaker slave holding inheritance and i asked them well did they give the 339 or 413 people any money no did they help them get to Canada? Oh, no. Well, did they give them any land or anything? Mm -mm. That makes me feel so sad. Hey, so um, oh, this is this slide is to give you a little idea of what was what it was like in Philadelphia for the formerly enslaved if they got their freedom and because uh, things were really changing. And this is a critical part of American history that most people, even people living in Philadelphia, don't know. Um, so many Northern states had black codes um, that were designed to control what free blacks could do. Um, and so the first Pennsylvania, uh, even before it was a state as a colony, it still had a, a uh, assembly and they had black codes that prevented interracial marriages or having sex. And it also uh, basically said, if you were not, didn't have a job, um, then you could be put in prison and you could be indentured in various other ways. So that was in 1726. Uh, and as a result, 
between that and and the importation of all these folks who were enslaved, uh, you you had lots of of Africans and and African Americans, uh, but you didn't have very many free people, free black people. So in 1765, if you remember, that was the date when the first manumissions were were dated. There were a hundred free black people in the Philadelphia area, uh, according to uh, research that, that other historians have done. But once the manumission process began and, and Quakers were not the only people who were doing manumission, by 1776, that was up to 600. So now we're beginning to get a little bit of a concentration. Pennsylvania, because the assembly was no longer controlled by Quakers, but they still had a lot of influence, um, they passed the first uh, Manumission Act in the United States. And uh, there's a lot to be said about that, but what it said it was going to do, and it didn't always do, but what it said it was going to do is anyone who was enslaved in 1780 would be enslaved for the rest of their lives, but that their children, after reaching a certain age, would be free. So that was going to guarantee, over time, a whole bunch more free Black people. Um, and the word got out uh, through uh, we would call today the grapevine. And and so uh, enslaved people in other parts of uh, the region, including down into Virginia and Maryland, heard about this and said, I'm going to free myself and I'm going to go to Pennsylvania and I'm going to be able to blend in with all these under, other free Black people and they're not going to have a, uh, it'd be harder for them to catch me and take me home. And so by 1783, you know, just uh, another seven years later, we're up to a thousand free black people. And that's the largest concentration anywhere in America. And because there are so many, all kinds of, of black run institutions begin to form. Um, and partially, or maybe prime, well, partially, because they weren't welcome to join white institutions. And so the First black churches were formed, uh, all kinds of black businesses were formed, uh, and uh, other kinds of associations to assist each other were formed. Uh, so what we'd call social clubs today were formed, mutual support. So all kinds of things were happening. And then after that, uh, people began to see that black folks in Philadelphia were creating their own society and beginning to accumulate wealth. And there began to be anti-black riots where white mobs of white people would come in and start tearing down buildings and setting them on fire and things. Uh, then uh, the people in the legislature said, hey, what are we going to do with all these free black people? We're not really comfortable. Maybe we could send them back to Africa. So the whole American Colonization Society got started and tried to get a chapter going in, in Philadelphia. And some of the uh, black leadership was initially sort of interested. Well, maybe this, maybe it could work, maybe it couldn't. Uh, in the end, the Philadelphia black community said, "No, we, we don't want to go to Africa," um, and and that chapter never got established. But then the second set of black codes happened in seventeen, in eighteen ten to eighteen thirty, which really clamped down on the kinds of jobs you could do. You couldn't. So people have been making money doing certain kinds of professions, and all of a sudden it said those are white-only professions. Um, and so some historians have argued that this period from 1780 to, to 1830 was the freest Blacks have ever been in America. And I, and I emphasize all this in my little three-minute thing, because this is the world that the people were trying to trace entered into. This, is, this was what was happening when they got their freedom. This is what they were trying to negotiate at that time. And then that's what their children, when the second set of black codes came in and the anti-black riots, that's what their children were having to face. So this is the this is a really interesting time in terms of the time and place are both important. Now we could talk about everybody's story is important, but it's just important to talk about this. And 
The last one there is, is also a critical part I don't want to ignore, which is there were people who made their livings off of capturing Black people who were free and taking them south and, and enslaving them. And, and they made good money at that. And so that was always a threat. Uh, even, even people who were manumitted by Quakers could be snatched up off the street and sold back into slavery. So that was always an issue uh, for the Black community in Philadelphia. Y'all heard what he said. This was some of the worst time in a, a Black person's life. Um, with all the, uh, we are free, started the lynchings. And no, you can't sit next to me. No, you can't hardly breathe. I don't think I would have wanted to been a fly on the wall for the black people at this time in the world. So this describes the process that our group is um, doing to discover what happened to these people who were freed by Quakers. Our work begins in the Quaker archives of Haverford College in Pennsylvania, searching for information about the names and locations of these innocent people, as well as information about the kinds and amounts of support that may have been offered to the newly freed people. Then the researchers will move to county census records, birth and death records, wills, black church records, records of the abolitionist societies who also provided support to newly freed people, historical societies, almshouses, insurance companies, newspapers, and other resources with records from the period of interest. <clears throat> by um, these old records coming to light now and by me being a part of Haverford's digitizing of the records, um, I just can't let it go. Uh, when we had the, the revealing of the records and everything, I asked them to have it out in my yard here and uh, put a Pandora box up, went, please open it. Had somebody open it. And my hope is that we have a better world and that the religious society of friends realized that some reparations to the descendants of the Africans is do something. What's it that do? Um, we call our project a reparative project to try to unite some of these families. So if you think about the comments that have been made by Avis and Dennis describing the history. Uh, we all know that individuals that belong to the Quaker Friends Society, they come in a variety of uh, political affiliations. But as you look at this, regardless of what they what people may believe politically, we do need to acknowledge that to enslave a human being was wrong and that we're not blaming people today for what happened in the past, but there is a really something that has to be said about being comfortable with being uncomfortable about this truth. And with that, when you think about what Dennis talked about on a couple of slides before, we have to analyze that and look at how that has impacted uh, race and racism in this country. And then as well as the pain that still exists for many Black Americans today based upon this history. It's not something that didn't happen. It's not something that should be ignored. And um, the ability to, ability to acknowledge this will help, hopefully, 
with the racial divide and biases that slavery has created. Additionally, uh, some of the history that I don't think people talk about as well is looking at how the slave trade and the laws that were created also impact uh, society today. So we had the Virginia Hereditary Slave Law of 1662, which created the caste society. And with that, even though that was many, many years ago, that put Blacks at the bottom and other people of color. That has created over time a number of conscious where I tell you to go sit in the back because I, I think you're Black, or unconscious biases, which impact how we behave with each other in the workplace, who our friends are, who we're comfortable with. And so a lot of these biases have come from what Dennis spoke of, and they've affected Avis in terms of how she's, what she's experienced within um, the Quakerhood, as well as some of the things that she dealt with when she went to school and not being able to be um, given the same educational opportunities that other white students had, uh, even though she went to the, the upper Devil school district. So with that, um, and as was Dennis also said, what we were hoping is that the Religious Society of Friends will look at how they benefited from the familial and generational wealth and privilege that over 200 years of slavery has brought, a, brought to them. And basically think about just as the Jewish people have, making sure that you don't forget that 12.5 million enslaved people and came during the transatlantic slave trade and of which only 10 million survived. Next slide. As we look at, Kitty. Sorry, it's not. <laughs> Not letting me do it again. That's okay. I'll talk anyway. So um, the the other thing when she is, brings up the other slide, when you look at the Philadelphia yearly meeting and the this part of the East Coast, we didn't have uh, that many Blacks that were brought here that were enslaved. So of the, say, 10 million that were enslaved throughout the U.S., only in the other countries, only 450,000 were in this particular area. So that's a relatively small group of individuals. And from that group of individuals, we have now over 42 million uh, African-Americans today that descend from this tiny group of Africans. So I think that's really an important part of history to think about. And I think the, only, the other thing in terms of reparations and that conversation, which is usually not uh, looked upon fondly, for the Religious Society of Friends, if people could just acknowledge spiritually that that this, what has happened is wrong, how the, the Society of Friends does still not, in some cases, even acknowledge what that history is, to say that, you know, if it's painful for them, then maybe they might want to forget it. But if you can acknowledge that spiritually, that will help heal. And it will help the, the interactions between all the groups within the Religious Society of Friends. And one of the more important pieces, which Dennis also touched on on the prior slide, was that the first generation of African-Americans that were freed by the Quakers were the freest um, ever. And uh, many of those institutions that were created at that time uh, still exist today. Next slide. Dennis? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so how are we doing this research is, is a, a logical question. And this is this is the answer to that question. So we are, have partnered with Howard University's Department of History um, and uh, they are using graduate, a graduate student is gonna be the PhD student you know, is the lead researcher and other people will be involved, but it's also going to be uh, a open research process. So, which means that uh, they will happily um, accept information that comes from any source into the, into the process, which is not to say they're not going to verify it, but 
but it's not like if if a Howard researcher didn't discover this, we don't care. No, they very much is going to be collaborating with anyone who has information that can be useful. Um, and that's going to be um, held there in their archives, uh, whatever we get. And there will be a website uh, where people can go and learn about the, the project. And the thing that we are hoping for and, and expect, but we don't know the numbers, is to be able to recreate some family history where we can say um, this person uh, was enslaved here and left that and went here and they did this kind of work and then they formed a family or reunited with their family and then they had these children and they attended this church and we can tell a story of their recreate a story of their lives down through the the generations and those kinds of family stories will be on that website as well and then we'll also create parallel to that is sort of traditional genealogical information that would be then available uh, to add to major genealogical databases. So if you have an African-American uh, somewhere who is looking through uh, FamilySearch or, or Ancestry.com, they don't have to know to go to Howard. They would find whatever we find in their databases without having to go searching somewhere else to see if they can find more. Uh, but in genealogy for African-Americans, uh, there are reasonable records back to about 1870 or 80. There's somewhat records down to back to about 1840 and very little before 1840. So if we can reestablish that link from these folks in 1770 or 1780 up until the 1840 or 80, then we have really uh, connected a chain that isn't there right now. Oh. And we want one, one more thing. We wanted to partner with Howard because everybody who has written about this history of Quakers and slavery has been a European American. And we think it's really important to have African American eyes looking at these documents. Different things may have meaning to them than they would to an European American. Hey, Kitty, hold it right there. Mm -hmm. This is where I get so passionate and excited and everything. Can you imagine that? We looked at a lot of colleges and universities and how it said, I believe in you, Avis, let's do it. One day soon, we just getting things together because you know how you got to do the districts and all this stuff. I'm going down there and I'm going to meet the people and they're going to meet me. And I'm going to tell them my dream of finding our ancestors and they learn real history as they do it. And my dream is they'd get to come up to Pennsylvania and see it, the beautiful Pennsylvania and the beginning of America, all the things we got. They can go into meeting houses and see old things in the meeting houses, um, uh, the Prince Halls, all the, the black uh, churches, and just walk through living history that's alive and well today. And um, that's what excites me. This can be done. It, honest to God, can be done. Why? Is because Quakers were great record keepers in their um, in their private papers and in the archives. Is a lot of information about Black people. When most with this with the research that we want to do is so unique is that before this time. Black people were written down in census as a piece of property, like a lamp or a horse. But with Quakers, they put the names because that was their money. I, if I was enslaved, I would look how big and healthy I look and big legs. I was expensive. So they had to name me so they could keep me different. And they kept them records. The other people that look, they were getting to a wall where we wouldn't be named. It's like 1870. What year was that, Dennis? Yeah, well, I mean, 18... What that wall is called the wall. 
Yeah, eighteen forty, but but for many it goes all the way to eighteen eighty before you right. get good records. With, with Quakers, we can literally go back to when they came over here on the boat. They came over here with William Penn, and they say he didn't bring no slaves with it. Well, who was dragging his dookie out the window? It was an enslaved person, so don't tell me he didn't have no slaves. He didn't do stuff like that. And so they came over here in 18, in the middle of the eight, 16 things. We can do it if if we just say this is a doable thing. I ask, we always work in the, we always work in Quakerism to make it an anti-racist community organization. And I asked, well, what do that look like? I ain't never seen that. But this can help. This can start the healing in a real way. My name is McClinton. I'm not no Irish person. Do I look Irish to you? When I go to job interviews before the internet, they would think Avis Wanda McClinton would be a redheaded Toe tapping Irish person, and here I come near big, beautiful me, and all of a sudden the job would go, and they can't speak English. They be oh, 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 Mary, do we have it? No, we don't have no more jobs. We don't have no more jobs. I would like to know who I came from and where I came from. If my ancestors had a ran faster, you would never see me, but they didn't. I'm here. And I want to do something, and I need your help. Not only do I need your financial help, because don't nothing run in America without mola money, but I need y'all to believe that the God that we profess to love said, Avis, would you, would you start this? And then you can step aside, and we got this. Not ever, not yet, that we as a society of religious people said our love is bigger than the color of the skin of each of us. And I wrote this last night on my hand, our love. We are beloved community. Where do we show our love at? I'm I'm doing my best to say I'm I'm setting all this up and behind the scenes is experts and big time people and companies that's trying to figure this out. But I want the religious society of friends to say, yes, it's worthy of our attention. Next slide, please. So piggybacking off of what Avis just said, what do we need from you? Well, individually, I think if you take all the information that you received today, and then takes have some personal self-reflection -reflect, and then a willingness to see outside one's own self for the greater good. Uh, as you know, we tend to gravitate, reflect on and understand and empathize with those that we feel comfortable with. And a lot of time that's not people who don't look like us. Uh, we need to acknowledge and own the past regardless of if it's painful or something that you may want to forget because of what your ancestors may have done. Um, but just look upon it and know what's true in your heart. Next, you can assist in supporting this project through accepting all of your past and respecting the impact of your past on your present and future. And lastly, supporting the project through positivity, word of mouth, research, and donations and other support. Next slide. So we ask you, if you can, please donate to our project. To the don donations go to the Friends Fiduciary Corporation. You can see the um, the link we have here. And um, perhaps, uh, Dennis, could you possibly put that in the chat so people could copy it? That might be useful. But in any case, this is a reparative project with the full recognition of the damage done to enslaved Africans and the generational wealth gained by the Quaker enslavers, including people like my family. Restoring the descendants' family histories is a small but important attempt to repair some of the damage. 
So please, we ask you to donate. Um, would you go back one step, one, one, um, friends and people that's not my friend yet. <laughs> um, I really thought this out before I talk to people because people don't believe black people. And I said, how can I make this a permanent, if something happened to me, thing that will go on? And and also that people won't be worrying about where their money go. And I looked into how that, and Friends for Disarray been down since the very beginning of Quakers in that time. And that's where the wealthy friends place their money to help other friends on projects in the in the world. And that's why I talk to friends for disarray people, the you know, the managers or whatever you call them, Nemi, and they suggest to open up a special fund. Uh, what's the name of it again, Dennis? It's a donor advised fund. A donor advised fund for perpetuity things. Um my dream and the dream that God put in me to tell you about today is that it's going to be beyond. It won't stop at just that Philadelphia yearly meeting. All the meetings of the 13 colonies, all the, on the East Coast, you know, the meetings, um, Baltimore, New England, you know, all of them. Once we get a way to do it, once we know how to look into the different archives in the different places, we go to to the next meeting and ask them, let's do this. The enslavement of a black person for all the many years is a big and complicated and gonna take a lot of smart minds to do. I've often asked God why he picked me to do it when he had his children that are Quakers, they got PhDs and contacts with all the world. And he keep reminding me in my dreams that trust me, I'll make a way. I'll turn their hearts. I'll turn their conscience. And you might say, Avis, you preaching to me. I hope I'm not preaching to you but we need a lot of help. We don't even have like a website. Everything is is at the beginning and um one I can't do it alone. I, I I need your money, but I need that you care about this. Um my my email is Aviswanda one because there's only one of me in the world at Gmail. Anytime you want to reach out to me, I'm here. I'm terrified because I got a lot of pushback. Even I got physically assaulted. Philadelphia yearly meeting had to get escorts for me to go into meeting houses. For me, it's a dangerous work, but I believe that God he got me. And if I die, he got me there. You know, when black people do something to deal with and the injustice that happened to them, they usually get their houses burnt down. They scared me enough, y'all. Would you go to the next? Oh, that's this the, the people that God gave me. They just came. I didn't even have to ask them. They just came. Dennis, Dennis, the white guy, <laughs> you see the white guy, Um, he was the one that encouraged me to follow my heart. Stephanie, that's a black woman. She's on in the air, um, uh, California. Kitty, Catherine, Ruby. North Carolina, Wood, Woods, his family is a um, enslaver, Quaker, and he Virginia, 
Tina, Pennsylvania, Chester, Quaker, um, Maryland. David, he worked on the, at Haverford on the digitizing, and he came aboard with us, but he no longer works at that college anymore, and my longtime friend, Judith. And I want to say that me and Judith worked on the project, the first project that I worked on with Quakers is to find a enslaved Africans that were buried in their cemeteries. And because of that work, um, I got me and my team, Judith and two others, got a um, private tour of Obama's White House in appreciation for our work with that. Thank you, Art Street friends. I really appreciate y'all letting me tell what we're trying to do. Um, a whole lot of generations after this will be beholden to you to give me this time to say what's on my heart and in my soul. If you don't remember anything, it's our love. Thank you, uh, everybody, for hanging in here with us. And um, I know a number of people posted questions in the chat, um, but we really would like to open up this discussion right now. Um, so uh, just uh, I, wave your hand or or use the like hand button or whatever, or just unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Uh, Lois, can you control this? Okay, but if people just want to speak out, that this is a small enough group, I think that will work. Okay. May I ask a question about the manumission? First, let's say you guys are amazing. I am to know you and um, have an opportunity to learn from you. Um, I have a question about two questions. Thank you, Dennis, for asking my answering my third question. Chat. Um, one question is if it thought it, I would love to understand the manumission process, like how did those documents created that Kitty shared, and how did it become the process to take it from a promise to um, legal um, contract? And the other is, um, are there Haddonfield uh, people uh, manumitted in that uh, 339? Thank you. Yeah, and so let me try to, to do the both of those. I think I can do them pretty quickly. So it, it was a legal document. And once the Quakers said, we don't want you to do it anymore, not only did you take a manumission document down to the courthouse, but now the the monthly meeting, the church said, we want to see a copy here. Um, so uh, if like the ones with uh, Cesar and Celia uh, basically said, as of today, you're going to be free, then it really usually meant that because uh, the enslaved person was given a copy of that document was really important for them to go have it in their hand as well in case somebody stopped him and said, you know, what are you doing out here? You say, I'm free. Here's my document proving that I'm free. What, what one of the things that the process, the project is going to try to answer is how many of those that actually were in the future, did they all get that promised freedom or not? And, and, and if the meeting said you, you need to turn in this document, is there going to be a notation in the meeting records saying, okay, it's 10 days, 10 years is up, and Jack uh, has now been given his document, uh, because it wouldn't have been given to Jack when he was 11. So when he got to be 21, was he actually given a, probably a new document that he could then take out into the world and say, I am not somebody's slave. I am a, I'm a free uh, citizen of the United States. Um, and we don't, 
so that's one of the goals is to figure out were those promises kept. And and Avis has raised because we know from reading other people in the history that other every manumission was not kept, whether it's Quakers or not. Um, so what you know, you might have something that says, I'm going to free you upon my death. Well, sometimes the heirs would jump in and say, No, 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 that's that, you know, that's my property. You can't let that property go free. Um, and then the courts, which tended to, the judges tended to be enslavers, said, yeah, 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 you made a good point. Go ahead and keep them. Um, so we, we want to, and that's why that language that Kitty read, which says, not only am I saying you're free, but my descendants are, are don't have a claim on you. Um, so, but the courts in Pennsylvania back in those days, um, allowed a lot of uh, funny business. Uh, and that happened with the 1880 manumission, uh, gradual manumission law as well. So that's one of the things that we should be able to trace. We we should be able to see is, did the actual person get to be free? Next question, or did I answer that? You got the head and feel part. Oh, the Haddonfield part, yes. So the the records of the 339 were records from the Philadelphia yearly meeting. And the yearly meeting included anyone who was a member of the Philadelphia yearly meeting. So we know, for example, that there's a cluster of, of enslaved people that were on Long Island, New York, that their uh, enslavers were members of the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting, and they turned in their manumission documents to the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. So Haddonfield was part of it, and we know there are some uh, documents in there from Haddonfield. There's also some from Northern Virginia and some from uh, Maryland. Hello. You can talk. Hi. What do you want to say? Avis, do you want me to talk or do you want the other lady to talk who's got her hand up? Oh, I didn't see. Sorry. I, I seen you, Kate. Okay, That's then okay. I'll go. I can wait. I, um, it's all right. <laughs> I'm <laughs> okay, sorry. since I'm on, I'll go before you, Rosalind. Yeah, that's fine. No worries. Okay. Here's my question for you. And it's nice to see everyone today. Um, is there going to be any link between the... Um, manumission information that is at Haverford and the manumission information that's at Swarthmore and potentially at any other place. Is that part of the plan down the road? Yeah, yes. Thank you, my friend Kay from Buffalo, New York. You're welcome, Avis. Um, and, and the other thing is that, that we also want to include all the manumissions going back to 1700. So the people who were manumitted before the 339, we want to include them as well. But we just have to start somewhere. And rather than say we're going to follow every person enslaved by a Quaker in the United States, we're starting with this particular batch. And then once we figure out exactly how to structure the research, how to build uh, a way to put the stories together, yes, that's the goal. The goal is to eventually do that, dude to try to include every person who uh, is descended from someone who had been enslaved by Quakers. Okay, may I ask a question? Yes. A comment. First, um, Avis, I want you to know that I've been praying for you um, ever since um, Julia um, brought you guys um, uh, to speak, um, do you jump in whenever you, you, you care to help me out here? But the, the thing I want to say to you is um, I, I listened to your uh, YouTube uh, interview with the um, uh, Friends Inquirer, I think it was. Um, sure. And I, I was so moved by, by that. And um, I've been praying for you ever since. And um, I also want you to know that um, 
I intend, I've already made up as part of our Juneteenth celebration, uh, a poster board um, complete with your um, manumissions um, icon and the picture of you um, in from the um, uh, YouTube link. And I'm, I'm thrilled to have to have this <laughs> and, and the other two uh, uh, pages here to add, um, because the thing is this, um, I, what you're doing, uh, it resonates with me because um, in, in praying to God uh, about what was I doing back in my hometown after my mother died and my father died before. Um, and he, he uh, told me that, um, tell them who they are is what my purpose is. Um, and then about three months after that, he sends in a man who answers a question for me, a white man, as a matter of fact, who answered a question for me some 58 years later, wondering who my relatives, um, the, the, my father's, my paternal grandfather's people were, and we're uh, related and, and huge researchers written a book about the family and you know was able to take me back uh, six generations to understand um how we were related and so the thing is I, i'm still in search and um my my question is this um my second great grandfather great great grandfather is buried in a quaker cemetery mm -hmm. um here in Frederick County, Virginia. And um, I'm wondering, did Quakers bury people who weren't Quaker in their cemeteries? It, it did it matter or you had to have known um, mm -hmm. someone? Sometimes they segregated it. They segregate the, the, um, the, the... can you hear me? Yes, I can. Sometimes. Like at Abington, they have a segregated part, and um, Upper Dublin had a segregated. But I'm thinking it was segregated because they was um, underground railroad, so it was a secret one. So I'm thinking it was called it segregated. But yeah, that's something else I'm doing. But I'm I'm doing this manumission stuff right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to get the people enslaved by Quakers, you know. Nobody never thought to look into this sphere of of research. And um Yeah, yeah. I, I can I can understand. Um, I, I really appreciate your prayers because I pray all the time about this. Yeah. Um I think is he God picked the wrong one, but No, he, he didn't. He didn't pick the wrong one. He didn't pick the wrong one. Y'all here <laughs> listening to, to it. Um what what I need is for individual meetings to look in their own records yeah, and just start seeing what happened and how it happened in, in there. Uh -huh. um, like the things I've learned about Philadelphia yearly meeting, that's New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and what's the next one, y'all? Maryland. Maryland. Um, when the enslaved people would die, they would take their bodies in Philadelphia to the new hospital. Remember that we was a new country, the University of Penn, and sell their bodies to to the hospital. Yes. Record of them. Yes. Hospital. But when I read that and other things like that, it, it crushed me. Yeah. I understand. Um, what do it mean to be a Quaker if you can't see the God? And then yeah. when they die, you can't rest in peace. And, yeah. and it's just like, it's it's the weight of this concern is, is massive. Yes, it is. It very much is. I um, don't want to not do my people right, but I don't want to hurt or it's off white people, but we both ain't do it, you know. Yeah, it's what we got yeah. now. We're both victims of the of the evil one who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So you know, really, um, there's 
victim on both sides. Um, but I want you to know this, that uh, right down the street from me, about three blocks, is a Hopewell Friend Center um, meeting house. And um, I'm very close with uh, some Baha'i friends, I have Baha'i friends and some Quaker friends. And um, I intend on going a, a, a bit further um, with the research so that I can find out because I have, I did get to understand that the land that this um, cemetery is on was owned by Quakers. Ro Robert McKay, as a matter of fact, um, this same gentleman, uh, Julia, that uh, owned that property where uh, Enrico Baltimore Cemetery is. So in any event, um, I'm, je I'm really quite uh, honored to meet you. And I want you to know that um, um, God makes no mistakes. He makes absolutely no mistakes. And so he gave it to you. Please claim it. Um, I understand being terrified when you said the man jumped on your back. Mm -hmm. I, I I thought, oh my God, I I hope that there are people who who can see that that this person needs some some help. But nobody can tell your story the way you tell it and show your heart, and that's what people need to hear to open up themselves mm -hmm. and be to be able to feel your pain and then work through their own um, issues in, in doing that. So I can't wait to, to see you and, and meet you. Um, Howard University is about an hour and 45 minutes from, from here. And um, I'm just jazzed to be able to talk about you at the upcoming June Tees. We have three of them. Um, so uh, Julia will be at one in Warrington on Saturday, and I'll be uh, at uh, one in uh, Winchester, Virginia at the Museum of Shando Valley and also in Front Royal, Virginia, Warren County, um, which uh, this is the first June, Juneteenth they're having. And it's gonna be a thrilling time and you will be talked about because I've already got you on my board <laughs> and I wanted to be here just so I could get some more information to talk about it because my Quaker friends are gonna tell me <laughs> what the deal is. <laughs> So thank you so much and God bless. Continue to bless you and everybody else here. Thank you. Any Anybody else would like to ask any questions? Please ask questions. I don't have a question. I just want to thank you guys. This is really deep and important work. I appreciate Where are you it. from? I'm from here from Memphis uh, Monthly Meeting. Hey, Memphis. Uh, and, uh, and I'm a descendant of uh, some of the Welsh Quakers, so I'm sure I have some history to uncover. <laughs> if you find any information, slide it to us. Oh, you know it. You you SEMA, right? Um, yes, Memphis is part of SEMA. Okay. Bless our hearts. Bless their hearts. <laughs> I know. <laughs> There's stuff going on tonight, and I was like, "I this is the one I'm coming to." <laughs> yeah, they called me. I told them I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm holding them in the light, and I'm over here. So. Before everybody leave, did y'all get our message? Did y'all know what are we trying to do? Can y'all do like this? Do you know what we trying to do? Yeah. Was With you. It, was it effective? Yes. I, I, and very I, clear. It wasn't effective. Okay. Effective and clear. Yes. It was very effective and very clear. And I took pictures of every screen um, shot, every <laughs> frame. Um, <laughs> so I hope that it comes through on my cell phone. I have a pretty good cell phone. Uh, but yes, it was effective. And I think that the best thing, the best, the, the most effective thing was that you are telling the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so there's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. And uh, one of the things I like about um, being involved uh, with coming to the table is that the people who are part of it have already outed themselves as being ones who want the truth told and, and to be set free and to be reconciled and, and liberated and, and all the things that are necessary to have a conversation to, right. as, as we call it, um, strengthening our ancestral kinship is, is where we are with it. Taking, taking America beyond the legacy of enslavement is what coming to the table is all about, um, Ava. So I thank you again. Well, well, my first cousin said, I'm worse than an old broken refrigerator. I won't keep nothing. 
<laughs> I'll send you an email right away. <laughs> Any, anybody else? How do you say have a good day? And 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 good I have luck? something. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I can't find the little hand thing. This has happened to me before. Sorry. Like this. Ah, that, that's what was going. On. Oh, I didn't see you, Catherine. Yeah. Okay. My bad. All right. I'm Catherine Knock, a friend's meeting of Washington, and that's Baltimore Unity Meeting. I would like to, you know, help you guys in any way that I can get the word out to more yearly meetings. Because I feel like Baltimore Yearly Meeting isn't really aware of this project. You know, and I think they weren't even really aware of, you know, your your work to get the graves identified and, you know, marked before they're all gotten rid of. Um, and I'm not sure how one does that, but, you know, it's the season of Baltimore's yearly meetings, annual session is coming up, French General Conference is coming up. You know, I guess I'm trying to think of ways of spreading the word out. These sessions are helpful. I think I've been to two of them now, Avis, that you've, um, that you've clued me into. Um, so clearly more people are hearing about it. But like I said, friends, the FMW, Baltimore Yearly Meeting, I'm not, just not hearing the buzz yet. Catherine, if I may, um, I'm, my name is Julia. I'm a journalist. I write for the Philadelphia Inquirer. I've done cool. two stories for the Philadelphia Inquirer about, um, about Quakers at confronting the legacy of enslavement. One is exclusively about Manumission 339 and beyond, and the other is about siblings um, who are Quakers who are from the Philadelphia area, and they um, dove deeper into their ancestry than anyone else had done and sort of engage in and discuss and created a book so that those who come after in their family will know that they are descended from a Quaker enslaver that was super intense. Um, so anyway, I have PDFs of those. If you drop your email in the chat, I'll send them to you. Okay. Thanks. Oh, it's good to know you're being FGC too. That's right. I think you told me that, Avis. Hey, KK. Hi. Hi. Again, I have a couple things. Um, Avis and Dennis, I've kind of email, I'm not kind of, I have emailed both of you and I just should let the rest of the group know I've given um, information about the Manumissions and Beyond project to the Buffalo uh, Friends meeting. Right now it's under consideration. They're trying to put together a plan so that it could go beyond just Buffalo, because we often do things with Orchard Park meeting, and we also oftentimes do things with our regional meeting. So that's kind of the status of what's happening with that. Plus, I've also shared with Avis, I'm pretty sure, that um, there is an all-Black radio station here in Buffalo, and they are very often willing to talk about all different kinds of things. So I did share that information so it could be spread with um, a variety of different people to talk about um, from different perspectives, what people are doing to take a look at um, what's happened in the past. So just to um, encourage us all, which it sounds like everyone's doing, to try to bring this whole idea of Avis's calling and all the rest of her group's <laughs> work forward. Hey, Kay. Yeah. Excuse me, Dennis. Kay, can you tell, yeah. would you tell, oh, this Kay. Well, oh, okay. Kay, could you say why you find this work important? Okay. I find the work important for a variety of reasons. First of all, I met um, Avis at Abington Monthly Meeting, and um, I was impressed with the work that she was doing and with her networking skills and her ability to um, draw people in to help her get what she needs to done to get done. At the same time, though, she is um, 
as we all know, ruffling a few feathers, but that often happens when you're doing good work and um, bringing causes to the forefront that need to be championed. I also um, have been honored that um, Avis has been um, very generous in sharing her thoughts with me and being receptive to some of the suggestions that I make periodically. I guess it's the educator in me that makes those sorts of things happen, but she's just a wonderful person. And I think that um, the other people that resonated with me is that I'm working on a book about um, a Philadelphia Quaker woman who um, several of you probably know. She Her name is Anna Thomas Jeans, and one of her bequests before she died in 1906 was $1 million that she gave to Booker T. Washington and um, Hollis Frizzle. And the money was to be used for the education of primary school teachers throughout the South. And the work that she did, or, or, or the money that she gave to these people, the, she had a couple stipulations. First, the gentleman had to come and get the check before she died because she did not want her family, because she was the last one um, to not get the money. She wanted them to get the money and not the family. And I thought that was really important. And my research has also substantiated that much of that money that she gave, um, it actually helped to create um, a very positive impact on education. And there's lots and lots of um, information about that. And Air Avis has actually asked me if uh, Anna's family was um, were enslavers themselves. They were not. I do not know about any other branches of her family. And I'm afraid that if I go down that path, I'll never get my book done, but maybe that'll be the next part. So thanks, Davis. You're great. Hey, Kay, you think I should get my suitcase ready? <laughs> Avis, I'm working on it. I got a whole list of places we're going to go visit. <laughs> Avis, I'm wondering if you'd like to say something about uh, Friends General Conference. I know that Catherine mentioned how important it is to uh, spread the word about this project more widely, and uh, that's coming right up. So what can you say about that? Maybe you or Dennis. Uh, hey, Dennis, you looking down and say, why don't you talk some, man? You, you like to talk. <laughs> yeah, so we are going to be doing two presentations at Friends General Conference, uh, one on Monday, the uh, July 1st, and the other on July 4th. So I guess we're celebrating something on July 4th, but um, yeah, we're going to try to spread the word. And I guess what I wanted to say to everybody else is, um, is, you know, carrying this leading, but it's really our jobs, each of us to do what we can to move it along. And, and so we, we're not going to get where we want to go if we don't get more people um, really understanding and advocating for the importance of the work and and yeah we'd like every monthly meeting in america to know about it and and be enthusiastic about it we'd like every yearly meeting but <clears throat> those of you who are quakers know that that process starts with some person saying i think this is important and taking it to their monthly meeting and then taking it to the yearly meeting that's sort of how that happens so so we just need everybody to do what they can to spread the word well, um, but I, but we, I was just going to say, but we, this presentation is is not the first, and and certainly will not be the last. And we're sort of, you you ask us to come, and we will come, uh, at least one of us in person, and the rest of us virtually, and depending on where you are. Dennis, what were you going to say, Katie? I was just going to say, Dennis mentioned other presentations. If you go to the, uh, on Facebook, the 339 Manumissions and Beyond Project has a page where you can see um, 
recordings um, of different presentations that we have done. One of them, for example, uh, Kay, you mentioned Black Radio in Buffalo. We did a program on WURD Black Radio in Philadelphia also that is on that on Facebook. <clears throat> and just because I thought of it, um, sometimes people want to give me, um, what's it when they pay the people to talk? Stipend or honorary. honorary. Yeah, I say write it to for, for this mm, Yeah, There's so many people that made money off of the enslaved that I want to go to to God without being exploitive. So everything put it in French for this I also want to mention Howard University. You know, has a public broadcasting. Um, TV station and radio station. And since you're hooked up with Howard now, that should be, you know, an easy avenue for them to push out mm -hmm. information about this. And then you I-, wanna I the, You want to be the coordinator for that? It's so much. We just doing like this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here in DC. I don't know anybody at Howard, but if I'll, I'll I start- I know somebody. I say, talk to okay. her. <laughs> okay. And then the other thing I always tell folks is that the National Museum of African American History and Culture is also serving as kind of a repository for a lot of information or a lot of genealogical information about enslaved folks they've got you know like one entire floor of the museums dedicated to helping people try and track records so let's okay. go to one whole room of our stuff watch one whole room you can go in there and see quakers watch in the museum yeah that's yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. We, need, we need to do that yeah and i Again, museums here in town, I don't happen to know anybody hooked up with the Smithsonian right now, but I'll check with FMW and see if somebody there is. All right. Well, um, I'd like to say this one last thing. Um, actually, uh, HUR, they have a radio personality that's going to be at this um, uh, June 19th, Juneteenth. Um, but uh, coming to the table... Um, I, I can bring this up at our next leadership call, which is the last Tuesday of the month. And because we have a chapter in Fairfax and we have a chapter in, um, I want to say Rockville, Maryland. And so all the, the, the Fairfax and, and Rockville, that that's the periphery of the Washington, D.C. area where um, Howard University is. So I, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, there's a way that we can... Um, I will ask Tom Wolf, the Wolf, um, how he can see us helping to get this piece out within the forty-nine chapters of coming to the table um, to help with that. Okay, to help with getting the word out and also just to to. Um, I mean, I'm ready to go talk to all my Quaker friends. I just needed so, enough information to kind of like when when the head starts spinning, it's like wait, 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 <laughs> you know. <laughs> um so I'm I'm there and I'm I'm willing also to uh you whoever it is it's it's a it's a phone call and sometimes it's a phone call at a higher level so I can get my national people involved in it and and see how they feel about it Julia is part of our even though she lives in New York she's part of our um chapter in in Pennsylvania in uh, Virginia here and uh, we'll put our heads together and Mary Hawk, I mean, we've got some folk that can also help um, make this happen. Hey, hey Terry. Really on anymore, but we'll, we'll definitely do that. But I, I must go now, God, Godspeed to, to all of you. And uh, it's We're on the way. Trust that God has already made the way. He's just chosen you to be the conduit. The people are ready. If they're believers in God, there's nowhere to hide anymore because... What you do unto the least of these, you do is unto me. If that doesn't crack eggs, I, I don't know what else will for people who are believers. So uh, I'm right there with you, sister. I love you. I, I was, love you all. I was saying Terry from Alaska. That's my friend, Terry. Terry. Hey, Terry, you see mm -hmm. how God's working? Can you see? Oh, God, it's all in this thing, girl. Can y'all see all... it? <laughs> Everybody. Thank you very much for taking time to listen to us. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you so very much.
Bye, man. Mother. Okay, turn off the recording.